There is no reason to believe that the population of the United States is some magic number that should remain unchanged. Indeed, America's tremendous population growth over the past couple of centuries has paralleled our economic health and development, as well as our influence around the world. But middle-aged nativists seem unable to give birth to either answers to our nation's immigration debate nor to new babies. Each of these has become a problem for us, and to the solutions to each of these problems, you can contribute because you've come to take the gold pill. The two major parties in the media can no longer be expected to represent our interests. They control the information we receive in order to keep us comfortable. Comfortable with their profits and with their power. Comfort is not what I offer, only the truth. Nothing more. There are four basic reasons why the United States should maintain a more friendly stance toward immigration. First is what I would call the national ethic of the situation. And the logic would begin with something like, who are we to decide who should and who should not be allowed in? And of course, some would answer, well, we're the ones who are already here. And so in some sense, we ought to be allowed to be the ones to make the rules about the drawbridge, as it were. All right, maybe. But for much of our nation's history, we have been more welcoming than we are now toward immigration, no matter whether you measure that in terms of the percentage of the world's refugees that we bring into the United States ourselves, or whether you measure that in terms of the number of immigrants to the United States relative to our population. We do go through, seemingly cyclically, stretches, sometimes long stretches of many years of anti-immigrant sentiment for a variety of reasons. But our welcoming immigration history matters. It matters because, I would argue, it matters because it defines us as a nation. We are quite literally a nation of immigrants and the descendants of immigrants. We have successfully made the case for a couple of centuries that we are defined by our laws, not a shared ethnic heritage. Our only unifying culture is that we as individuals are tolerant of other cultures. Indeed, our acceptance of immigrants, of new cultures, keeps us tolerant. We cannot allow ourselves to become a nation of ossified nativists. Second, a growing population enhances our ability to project influence around the world. Through any means that one might contemplate that, our influence is enhanced by our size. And while we should debate whether America should be trying to exert any influence at all whatsoever around the world, when we are at our best, when we stand up for democracy, when we stand up for capitalism, when we stand up for human rights generally, we have opportunities to make the world a safer place as well as a more ethical place. We have opportunities to make the world more prosperous. But even a growing population cannot deliver influence if the international message is not backed up by a domestic policy that demonstrates our commitment to the rule of law above the rule of a common culture. Our relatively open immigration history is what has given demonstrable proof through the years of our commitment to democratic pluralism. And this pluralism is the true source of any legitimate claim to what anyone might try to call American exceptionalism. In other words, turning into a land of ossified nativists would not only be bad, it would be bad in a way that would be un-American. And being American is a very good thing for America to be. Third, the United States has a population problem today that is threatening to become a population disaster. We have a relatively low birth rate compared to years in the past. And so our internal population growth rate has recently dropped to the lowest rate in a century. Slower rates of immigration are also projected to be lower in the future than they have been in the past. And so the problem is not that we don't have enough people, per se, 
It is that we do not have enough young people. Our population is aging and in a way that is not sustainable. The problem is that our biggest retirement program, like many others, Social Security, is run a bit like a Ponzi scheme, as you're well aware. Younger people pay for the retirement of the older people. Indeed, most pension plans in the United States are run a bit like this. They are underfunded, but rely on payments from younger generations to keep them afloat. This works okay as long as the ratio of retired people to working people remains stable. But it doesn't remain stable. It continues to increase, and it's projected to increase very quickly over the next 40 years. By the year 2060, the ratio of people over 65 to the working population under 65 is projected to increase from 28% to 42%. The only solution for this population problem is, well, we need more people in their prime earning years by the year 2060. There's no time to waste. We better get started right now. If you can hear my voice, please start making babies. The fiscal health of my personal retirement program depends upon it, and in due time, so will yours. Alternatively, we could import babies. And we could import people who make babies. Statistics show that immigrants are much better at making babies than those of us who were born here in the United States. And fourth, we need a welcoming immigration policy because we need to have a welcoming capital policy. We need to be more welcoming of immigrants because we need to be more welcoming of capitalists. Many investors abroad demand a more open immigration policy because they need access to talent, both in terms of what they can find here as well as what it is that they can bring in from abroad when they find it difficult to identify the talent that they need. In general, we're going to have to get used to the idea that our population, which was 100 million 100 years ago, 200 million 50 years ago, 300 million 10 years ago, is going to be 400 million in another 35 or 40 years. Now the growing population is okay, but remember, wage rates are driven by the ratio of capital to labor. So a growing population means we need a growing capital base. We must make the United States the place where everyone wants to do business as well as the place where everybody wants to live. This means a couple of things with regard to corporate public policy. First and foremost, it means getting rid of the corporate income tax, which is a terribly inefficient system that imposes huge costs on our economy without even raising a tremendous amount of revenue for the federal government. It discourages businesses from growing in the United States as well as investing in the United States from abroad when they have an option of being anywhere in the world. It also means reducing the regulatory burden that we impose by states and the federal government on businesses. Again, making investment environment more conducive to growth and to better compete for capital investment from abroad. This is the way to make the United States the place where people want to do business. We must make the United States the place where entrepreneurs can drive their own destinies. There are three basic concerns that arise among people who are worried about making our immigration policy more open. First is a concern about public resources. It has been mythologized that immigrants use such a high ratio of public assistance to tax contributions that they are actually a net drain on government resources. Not only is this a myth, but the truth is that immigrants actually demonstrate a lower ratio of public assistance to tax revenue than native-born Americans. This is not only because they are typically young and healthy, and not of school age, by the way, typically, but also because they are legally precluded from accessing many government assistance programs until and unless they become permanent residents or citizens. 
The second concern revolves around security. Many Americans fear unknown foreigners and unknown threats. This too has been mythologized in terms of the size and scope of the threat. It's actually much more manageable at the border using technology, using resources that we can easily bring to bear to resolve the situation in most cases. Third, there is a concern about the fair treatment, fairness of how we treat undocumented residents and applicants. Nobody likes the idea of somebody who doesn't follow the rules, jumping the line ahead of people who do follow all of the rules. Someone who has complied with all of the laws certainly deserves first access. Nor would we be realistic if we thought that an unfairly quick path to legal status would not create some sort of incentive for others to follow their example. But let's be candid. Because we want undocumented residents to eventually become documented, and in my view, as soon as possible, we want them to have some path to citizenship. Because of this, no political solution can exclude them in the long run. And so now we find that two legacy political parties share an interest in continuing the debate itself rather than finding a solution. One side wants uncompromised security and has no real interest in acceding to greater immigration, which they do not view as a positive outcome. The other side wants better immigration policy, but has no reason to accede to enhanced security measures, which after all, don't come cheap. Consequently, each side has more interest in the debate than they do in finding overlapping interests. No common ground means no solution. The Biden administration's recent proposal for immigration policy sidesteps those Americans who are concerned about border security. And whatever we may think of those concerns, the White House's position has done nothing to bring the two sides of the debate closer together. What I might suggest is that immigration is so important that we should be willing to dedicate the resources necessary to bring some resolution to the border. And not just in terms of security, getting rid of the enormous backlog of application cases will require a complete rethinking of the adjudication process altogether. Let's be candid. The reason there are so many undocumented immigrants in the United States is not merely because we don't have a wall. The fact is that the legal, legal protocol is embarrassingly slow and unpredictable. Our goal should be to successfully admit applicants with a three-day background check. Anything else is an embarrassing admission of bad planning. So too is the embarrassing lack of facilities at the border that makes it seem palatable that we would even contemplate separating members of families apart from one another. This won't be easy. Politics has become a battle. On one side of the battle are politicians and pundits, journalists and jurists, regulators and revisionists who believe that the government is better able to solve our problems than we are ourselves. On the other side of this debate are things like science, history, people like you, people like me, and common sense. Thanks for helping me make this sense a little bit more common. Thanks for coming to take the gold pill. Comfort is not what I offer, only the truth, nothing more.